Can your bank legally steal your money? Well, new laws about this are going to shock you. Now, back in 2008, during the great financial crash, banks and other financial institutions around the world were deemed too big to fail. They were bailed out by governments, they were bailed out by central banks, and of course, they were bailed out by your tax dollars. But since then, laws have changed to make sure that these bank bailouts don't happen again. But now it's put you and I as bank customers and depositors in trouble. So in this video, I'm gonna explain what a bank bail-in is. I'm gonna explain what laws changed that now allow your bank to legally steal your money. I'm gonna talk about what countries and what banks you need to be worried about the most. And of course, what we can do to protect ourselves um, from our banks being able to legally take our money. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss and I'd like to talk about money because I want to change the way you think about it. Because if you can change the way you think about it, it can bring more freedom, more options into your life for yourself, for your family, for your legacy, and so much more, so many options. And that's why I like to talk, make these videos. If you wanna help me get these videos out to more people, you can take one quick second, do me a favor, click on that like button so the algorithm sends it out to more people. Of course, hit the subscribe button if you are not already subscribed. All right, so today, if you're new, you won't know this, but if you, if you watch my channels on a regular basis, you know that I like to go through history because history tells us where we're going in the future. And so today we'll go through a little bit of history. We're gonna go back to the year 1792. And this is where things really began. In 1792, we had the panic of 1792. This was the first major banking crisis that we had. And we saw the then Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton. You might recognize that name. Alexander Hamilton, he was the Treasury Secretary at the time, and he authorized the purchases of security. So this was the first bank bail-in that we see back in 1792. This is kind of where it started. I'm gonna show you the history, how it escalated, and then I'm gonna show you what changed that you need to know about today. Fast forwarding through time, of course, we go to 1929. This was the Great Depression. I'm sure you've probably all heard about that. Maybe looked at it a few times, of course, the Great Depression. During that time, we saw you know the massive um, stock market crash. Everyone lost their money. Unemployment rate skyrocketed, all those things. But that's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about is the government program that started to buy uh, and refinance mortgages, buy stocks, and basically to prop the market up. So they were buying and refinancing defaulted mortgages. And again, so the market crashed, the government stepped in to bail out, keyword, bail out the financial system. Fast forwarding again, 1989. This is something pretty near and dear to me. Um, because of uh, the savings and loans, I had uh, some connections there. Um, I talked about how I got my start in real estate um, when I was very young, when I was like 19, 20 years old. And it was because my one of my best friend's grandfathers um, owned a bank and he owned a savings and loan bank. He was one of the few saving loan banks that survived this 1989 um, savings and loan scandal or crash or crisis. Um, unfortunately, they didn't make it through the 2008 one more on that later. But back to 1989, the savings and loan bailout in 1989, uh, basically we had over a thousand savings and loans at the time that were deemed to be insolvent. Basically they didn't have any money, they were broke. And so um, they all went out of business. The good majority of them went out of business and that led to a $160 billion bailout by the government. Again, a bailout. Remember that word, bailout. We're gonna talk about that. Then of course, this is the one that everybody knows, which is the 2008, this was the great financial crash that happened. And we can see that this was caused, well, if you know, this was caused by mortgage-backed securities. So the banks were over leveraged in the mortgage uh, market. They were creating all these, these mortgages and putting them together into securities where tra- they were trading these. They got way too risky, way too carried away. If you haven't watched the movie, The Big Short, you should watch that. Um, and so. At that time, this is when things started to change. So 1792, 1929, 1989, 2008. And at that point, enough, that was it. We can't do this anymore. And the government created what's known as the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act. Stabilize the economy, right? Emergency Economic Stabilization Act. And it went into this bank bailout of 2008. At that time, it was a $700 billion bank bailout. Now. At the time, if you lived through this, at the time, 700 billion was so much money, it was unfathomable. It was like, oh my gosh, we cannot believe the government is gonna do this. $700 billion, there's no way, it's too much money. Of course, now 
we're throwing around trillions like they're nothing. But reports show that as much as this, uh, even though it was supposed to be 700 billion, it's actually cost upwards of $16 trillion, as you can see here in this Forbes article right here. Most people think that being the, the bailout was 700 billion, right? But the Special Inspector General for TARP, which is the bailout program, um, says that the total commitment of government is $16.8 trillion. So that was the bailout of 2008. We can see here, this is the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008. They officially called the bank bailout of 2008. Of course, like I said, it was supposed to be $700 billion, turned out to be upwards of $16 billion. But that is where things started to change. As a response to that bank bailout, if you remember, if you were alive back then, the people were pissed. They were pissed. They bailed out the banks, right? So the banks make all the money on the way up, privatized profits, but when they lose money, instead of them losing money, we socialize the losses. So they make the profit on the way up, but if they lose, then the public has to bail them out. Taxpayers, you and I have to pay them. And so the people were pissed, right? Public anger. At the time we had Occupy Wall Street. People were just taken to the streets. They were done with Wall Street and manipulating them. And so Congress had to act, of course, right? And they passed what's known as the Dodd Frank. Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Act is the key piece. And basically that eliminates bank bailouts. So I kept saying, remember bailout, bailout, bailout. Remember that word because this is when things change. They eliminate bank bailouts, but they opened up another door. They opened up another door of something much more scary. So at the time, the Dodd-Frank Act, you can see here they are, the big Wall Street big wigs, the senators up there, strengthening Wall Street reform. They promised to do better, right? That's what they said. You can see this was the, um, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. It sounds so good, it's, it's for you and I, right? And of course, if you were around at that time, you know, you can see them all standing around. Here's our current president, Joe Biden, then President um, Barack Obama signing this into legislation. And that is the day that everything changed. So let's take a look at that. So we have created a brand new beast. We had bailouts, 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 the government, the Federal Reserve stepping in to bail out the banks. And that's it. No more bailouts anymore. The banks that are too big to fail now, they've only gotten bigger since then. We've seen more bank consolidation. Banks have become bigger, but now the governments can't bail them out per that bill, they're not allowed to do that. Instead, instead, it's gonna be unsecured creditors, all right? So what that means, who's the unsecured creditors? Instead of the government, it's you and I. It's you and I taking the risk, it's the unsecured creditors. We're gonna talk about what that means. I'm gonna show you in a chart here in a minute. And so we went from having bailouts to now what's known as statutory bail-ins. In the U.S. they passed the law, this was uh, back in 2010, about these statutory bail-ins. And the, FD, FD, F, the Fed, the FDIC banks, um, basically what they do is they can take these banks that are failing and they can put them into receivership. All right, now, I'm going to explain to you what that means in a second. Now we can see basically what this means is that you take all the people and they give the money to the few banks that are left, right? Instead of Basically, this used to be the government, this used to be the Federal Reserve here, and now it's the people, it's you and I, that are stepping in to do that. So what happens is when you can't pay your bills, when you're insolvent, if you've taken on too much debt, you lose your job, you go into bankruptcy. And in that bankruptcy court, they put all the assets into receivership, all right? And now there's a, a negotiator, there's somebody managing that bankruptcy, and they are going to negotiate with their creditors. They're gonna mark that debt down and do what they can to get the bills paid. And so basically that's what happens now. The, F, the Fed and FDIC now takes these banks into receivership and then negotiate this. And this is where things are going to get dicey for you. All right, now, uh, before we get into the details of what this really means for you, I wanna show you that there has already been a couple of experiments. So the first one, really the big experiment was Cyprus back in 2013. If any of you guys have been around long enough to uh, remember that one. And basically what happened is the, the country of Cyprus had had a big problem, they ran out of money. And so they decided that, well, we can't bail them out, the government, so we're gonna bail them in. So that means they just decided to take money from depositors, uninsured depositors that had 100,000 100, euros or more, they took a large percentage of the money in the bank. 
mm, thank you very much. We'll just take that money, right? And in exchange for that, they converted that money into stock, into the bank, equity, but it was worthless. So they didn't just give them nothing. They didn't just take it. At least they were kind enough to give them some worthless assets. If you call it that, they called this financial reallocation. So, hey, we're just going to go ahead and take your dollars and reallocate them into stocks, even though they're worth nothing, useless assets, all right? So how does this work? And this is the key piece that you have to understand because this is all legal. This is all legal proceedings. This is all legal jargon, all right? So when you deposit money into the bank like this, that money is no longer yours. You do not own the money. You've deposited it. You deposit the money into the bank and now the bank owns that. Now what they give you is an IOU. They owe you the hundred dollars. So now that is an asset on your books is the IOU, all right? That is why you get interest. They're giving you interest on the money that they've borrowed from you. And it's an unsecured loan. So when you get a loan on a house, that's secured. It's secured against the house. If you default, you lose the house. A credit card is unsecured. There's no asset backing it. And so when you put the money into the bank, it's no longer yours legally. The bank owes it to you, but it's an unsecured loan, meaning they can just default on it, all right? So that is how this works. And this is why it's important. So if the bank goes into bankruptcy, into receivership, which the FDIC will negotiate, they look at all the assets of the bank. Your money in the bank is the bank's asset. It's not your asset. So um, an example of this would be, let's say that I went into bankruptcy and the bank, the, the, the receiver would come and look at my house and look at all the assets and they look at my cars and these things. And let's say that you left your um, mountain bike at my house. Well, I'd say, well, that's not my mountain bike. That's my friend's. And then of course that wouldn't be counted in my, uh, in my bankruptcy because it's not, it's not, it doesn't belong to me. All right. Now this is where things start to get really interesting. All right. And now this is for most of the world, we're going to talk about which parts are in the most danger, but this is the bank recovery act, the BRRD. And this is where they built in the mechanism for the bank bail-ins. And so what they said is quote, ensure shareholders and depositors to pay their share of costs. So by having your money in the bank, being a depositor, you should have to pay your fair share of any bankruptcy proceedings, any insolvency. That's what they're saying, right? And we can see the BIS. The BIS is basically the central bank of central banks. And they built this bank resolution framework. Uh, it was Mr. Fernando Restoy. And he said that bail-ins would be involved in the first phase of a rev resolution. So what that means is before a government would even consider to help out with a bailout, the bank would first have to bail in. They'd have to first take all the depositors money before they would even consider a bailout. And we can see here, this is the European Commission Bank Recovery and Resolution. They said when authorities determine, when they determine that a failing bank can't go through the normal insolvency proceedings, that authorities use this, these resolution tools, exactly what we're talking about. They said that the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive, this is the BRRD we're talking about, will ensure an orderly resolution of failing banks with minimal costs, look at this, with minimal costs for taxpayers. So the taxpayers aren't gonna do it, it's not a bailout. Who's gonna do it? You and I as depositors. And this says down here that it will go through the bail-in mechanism. Again, that's taking money from the deposit. All right, so now you might want to know which countries are in danger, right? Depending on where you're at. So we saw that in 2014, the BIS and the FSB, they signed a supranational law, whatever that means. That's a really big deal, supranational law. So basically what this means is that all the governments of the world have decided to act together. They've all agreed to this law and they're going to average bank deposits and they're gonna consider bank deposits as unsecured creditors. Exactly what I'm talking about. So you're a creditor and that means a lot legally. So we can see if you're in one of these countries, this is the G20, the United States, China, Euro, Japan, Germany, India, United Kingdom, France, Italy, Brazil, Canada, Russia, South Korea, Spain, Australia, Mexico, Indonesia, Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Switzerland, Argentina, Singapore, and South Africa. If you're in one of those countries, you are going to be affected. You can see it here in this illustration here. Basically, if you're in one of these countries that is highlighted in purple, 
and probably in pink, you are at risk of lo losing your bank deposits. Now, what about the FDIC? If you live in the United States, you say, well, the FDIC insures my money. So if it does get lost, they'll give me my money back, right? Other countries have similar, similar things, right? In the United States, up to $250,000 per depositor is guaranteed. So if the bank were to go under, the FDIC gives me that money, all right? But there's a couple problems with that. The first problem is that it is barely funded. They barely have any money. So even if a small percentage of people try to claim that, they'd run out of money. But it goes deeper than that. As a matter of fact, in 2012, the FDIC and the BOE, that's the Bank of England, they created a new bail-in requirement. This is the um, page from their book, Resolving Globally Active System Systemically Important Financial Institutions. All right. And what they decided is that FDIC is no longer just an insurance provider. Instead, now they are an executor of the bail-in process. So they're basically like a receiver in the bankruptcy process. So let me show you what that looks like. And as we can see here in this um, IMF memo here, we saw the uh, on April 2012, uh, this is the from bailouts to bail-in, how they're changing from bailouts to bail-in, mandatory debt restructuring of systemic financial institutions. But even if the FDIC wanted to bail everyone out, could they? That's a bigger question. Like I said, there is so much outstanding debt. What could the FDIC really do? Let's take a look at that. So again, per this report that they put out right here, resolving globally active, systemically important, we can see a couple of things here that are of, of importance. So first, under this OLA, the FDIC may be appointed receiver remember, may be appointed as a receiver for any U.S. financial company. So the bank goes under, the FDIC isn't there just to give them a bunch of money. No, they're there to act as a receiver in that insolvency, in that bankruptcy. All right, these are, these are key legal terms and these mean a lot. So losses of any financial company placed into receivership, right, through bankruptcy, uh, will not be uh, aborn to taxpayers. They won't be aborn to taxpayers. Taxpayers won't be responsible for this. That means the government they're not gonna bail them out, right? But by common and preferred stockholders, debt holders, and other unsecured creditors. Now you remember just a while ago, I showed you that average depositors were gonna be considered as what? Unsecured creditors, that's right. And what does the FDIC have the power to do? They have the power to write down or convert it into equity. So let me explain what this means. So what, what the bankruptcy court will do, what the receiver will do is they'll negotiate the debts down. So for example, you may have $200,000 in the bank, but through the, the, the bankruptcy proceeding, through the receivership, they could mark those assets down. Hey, it's 200,000, but we're, we're doing a 60% haircut across the board. So now you have $80,000. So here's your insurance, but for 80,000, not for the full 200. Now they could mark it down to whatever level they want. They could mark it down to 80, mark it down 80%, 90%, 10%. We don't know the answer, but that's what they're doing. We can see here, they go a little bit deeper and they say that such a strategy would involve the bail in a write down or conversion. So again, writing down the debt. So if not giving you full face value, writing it down or conversion, converting it over into equity of the failing bank worthless equity, right? And this is both the US and the UK approaches do the same to ensure continuity. So the US and the UK, the EU are all doing the same thing. And even if the FDIC wanted to pay you everything, right here is about how much money FDIC has. This little line right here, 25 billion. This is how much money sitting in the banks, about 9 trillion. So if you can do math in your head, 25 billion is not gonna cover $9 trillion in liability. And that's just money um, in the bank, but really they have to cover about $300 trillion in derivatives. So let me give you a visual representation of what that looks like. All right, so on the screen, this is 100 bucks. Most people know what 100 bucks look like. Now, maybe you don't know what $10,000 looks like. That's a stack, that's like your average bank stack. This right here would be $1 million, all right? So let's, add, let's keep going here. That's $1 million visual representation. Right here, we're looking at $100 million. You got a couple big pallets. You can make yourself a couch with it. Right here, we have 
one billion dollars now we got stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks and you got your little love seat that's a billion dollars all right now look at this this is 25 billion dollars right here this is the f fdic building and this would be 25 billion sitting there that's what the fdci has now this is what they're on the hook for here's the fdic money but they're on the hook for all this, all this, a trillion dollars here, nine trillion dollars here, and all these assets over here. And then that's money in the bank. And then on top of that, they are on the hook for all of this and all of this, which is $300 trillion. So you can see the FDIC insurance is there, but it would never work. In addition, the way the laws have been changed and written, they don't even have to. They can mark it down and they can convert it. As a matter of fact, they are required to do that before they could even consider any type of additional bailout, all right? So what should you be looking at to know if your bank is in danger? What are the red flags that should be flashing a warning sign that you should be watching? So first of all, does your bank make loans? Do they make business loans? Do they make house loans? Because if so, that's what got the banks into trouble, right? They, got, they gave out bad loans. That's what happened in the savings and loan scandal. They gave out bad loans. My friend's grandfather who owned a bank, it went out of business. They made too many bad loans. They couldn't cover them. So does your bank make loans, business loans, mortgage loans? Are they pushing you into financial products? Do they say, hey, you should really think about investing your money. Hey, you should be thinking about buying bonds, things like that. Do you see that they're open less and less a few hours? Have you had any problems going to withdraw money out of the bank? Have you tried to pull out $5,000 or $10,000? Have you ever asked them how long it would take you to withdraw your money? Because in some cases, it can take you a very, very long time. Now, what do you do to protect yourself? Well, just like anything, there's there's different ways to do asset or risk, risk management. So the first way is through allocations. All right, the next one is through position sizing. So through allocations, you can diversify your exposure. So instead of being all in one bank, you could be in multiple banks. Instead of being in all banks in one country, you could be in multiple banks in multiple countries, right? So you could have one bank in the United States, you could have five banks in the US. You could have a bank in the United States and a bank in Japan or Panama or Singapore or anywhere you want, London, all right? Also, you can use smaller banks that won't have as much exposure. So local banks, local farmers and merchant banks, you can use um, brokerage accounts, each aid, Charles Schwab, things like that. They're not doing all this high leverage, risky lending and whatnot. Um, also, of course, what I always continue to talk about is hold assets outside of the banking system. Now, there's lots of different assets outside the banking system, of course. It could be real estate, it could be gold, it could be things like that. Of course, I like to be my own bank. And what does that mean? We can store our wealth ourselves Instead of giving it to the bank for them to hold, and there's a good chance they don't give that money back to me, I can hold it myself, which means I can self-custody it. So that means I have it. Nobody can go bankrupt. Nobody can take it from me. Nobody can steal it from me. I have my sovereignty. That means it's up for me to decide what's in my own best self-interest. Um, if you've done much banking like I have, I go to wire money, I wanna get into this new investment, and they say, who is this person? How do you know them? How long have you known them? Why are you sending them money? I have to have permission to send my own money. But when I hold it myself, when I'm my, my own bank, I have sovereignty. I can direct myself as I see fit. And of course, my favorite way to do that is with Bitcoin. And I get it, I get it, I get it. Not everybody's into Bitcoin but maybe you should take another look at it because it helps you accomplish all this. But of course, gold can do it, real estate can do it, and so many other things, all right? So that's what I got for you today. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Do you see that you're at risk in the banks? Is it something that you're worried about? Is it something that you're thinking about? Leave me a comment, let me know. And of course, I have um, started another channel. I'm making videos on another channel. And so leave me a question down below. I'm gonna grab the questions and I'm gonna answer them on a video on my other channel. There will be a link down below. If I pick your question to be answered in the video, you're gonna get $25 in Bitcoin just for submitting your question down below. All right, now as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it, I've worked pretty hard for you. If you don't like the video, I guess that's okay. But give me a thumbs down. I'm fine either way, but let me know why down in the comments, all right? That's what I got for you today. To your success, I'm out.